I bring you greetings on behalf of our pastor, the Reverend David C. Camp Sr., and my lovely First Lady, Teresa Camps. I bless the Lord for them in their absence. Amen. Amen. I would like to give honor to my husband, Reverend Kenneth Williams. Amen. And I would like to give honor to all of the deacons, ministers, reverends, pastors, everyone in their places on this morning. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to be in his house because in a, an era that we live in where you could just simply be hanging out and get shot, where you can simply go to school and die. Being alive and being able to come into the house of the Lord is not something that any of us should ever take lightly. That's the world we live in. A hostile world. A dangerous, cold world. But we're grateful that we serve a God who protects us and keeps us and guides us and allowed us to be here. And so we should be grateful for that opportunity. And every time we come into the house of the Lord, we should be willing to offer a sacrifice of worship, a thank you. But worship is deeper than thank you. And we're going to get there in just a, a few moments. So now the protocol is out of the way. I want to take us back to the book of Judges. And we were in chapter 7, but we're going to kind of flex back and forth a little bit between chapter 6 and chapter 7. And I thank God for my agape family, those who are here and those who are out uh, on today, that the Lord be with them and keep them. And happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans. And they know that one of the things as far as every preacher has their style, and I guess my style is storytelling is what they always try to try to tell me is that it's a story because I'm about working the text and working the novel the, the the narrative so that it can be applicable to our lives okay because even though it may be old it's still some of the same things that we see in our daily walk okay so we're going to take a journey and we have this man Gideon and the word for today is this is no ordinary battle. All right. No ordinary battle. Some of you may be in the midst of some battles. Some of you may be coming out of some battles. Some of you may be on the cusp of going into a new battle. But whatever the battle is, know that this is no ordinary battle. Mm -hmm. It is comprised of a lot of things that just would baffle the average mind and the average believer. And that's where God is going to show himself strong in our lives because we don't already have some of these things, these tools, and, and we're going to defeat our enemies and our giants in ways that we would not have thought or perceived, and that's how we're going to know it's God. Amen? So let's look at, look at the text and look at chapter 7, verse 15. It says, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. So he's giving you the victory over our enemy. And so in order to understand what's happening here in the text, we need to get a little bit of history and the Midianites do have a long history in the Bible. Midian actually was the son of Abraham that Abraham had with his second wife, Keturah, after Sarah passed. A lot of people don't realize that Sarah passed and Abraham took a new wife. And when he took a new wife, he actually had other offspring, okay? And so from that, Midian was born out of that union, a legitimate union, but there came Midian. And as the Bible transpires, as history transpires, the Midianites actually stole Joseph, the king of dreams. But Midian was also a saving place for Moses who escaped out of Egypt and where he was healed and delivered and where he prayed and he heard from God. And he also married the high priest, uh, the, the daughter of the high priest of Midian. 
So Midian has a complicated history in the Bible, and especially with the Israelites. So it, it, it's a little complicated. Sometimes nowadays the, 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 the young folks will say, will say, are you single? Are, are you in a relationship? Or is it complicated? So that, that the third, it, it, it's complicated, okay? So they have a little bit of complications when it comes to that. And so eventually conflict did arise between the Israelites and the Midianites, and Israel won its battles against the Midianites, and the Midianites won their battles over the Israelites, and they kind of went back and forth. But by the time we get to the book of Judges, what has transpired is Israel is being oppressed by Midian. Well, the Israelites are being oppressed by the Midianites. The Israelites endured great hardships during this time of oppression. They were impoverished for seven long years by the Midianites. So they weren't able to produce anything, or whenever they did produce something, the Midianites would come and ravage their land. So they would take from them, they would steal from them, okay? And so they, they were constantly being oppressed, and they couldn't move forward. And how many people know when you're in an oppressive situation, no matter the situation, you begin to develop a mindset about yourself, about the world around you, about all kinds of circumstances and situations. You feel like, what's the need to grow? What's the need to produce whenever the outcome is going to be the same? Somebody's going to take away my blessing anyway. What's the point in being blessed? But life can break you down to that point. It can defeat you to that point if you allow it, especially when you don't see an end to your pain. You don't see an end to your circumstance. It doesn't have an expiration date. So you in this thing indefinitely, in this hardship indefinitely, day after day after day, season after season, you plant, you try to grow, it gets destroyed. And it's a pattern, and it constantly repeats itself. And you feel like you can't get ahead or get forward or, or move past or beyond your circumstances or your situation. You know you're greater than what it is, and you know you're destined for something better than what you already have, but for some reason you can't get out of this negative cycle that constantly feeds you in. Amen. How many people have been there? I have. Amen. Amen? Some of us might still be there. Amen. But you don't have to stay there when you're a child of God and, and, and Gideon is going to show us how. And so with that, God heard the cries of the Israelites and he called forth a deliverer of his people one more time. Because this is after the day of Moses. So one more time he calls forth a prophet named Gideon. And when you're God's chosen, it, it doesn't make you exempt from hardships because Gideon wasn't over with the Midianites. He was in the same situation as the other people. But you may be in your situation, you may have raised your hand, but you don't, you may not even realize that God may have destined you to be the deliverer out of that situation. That he may have called you to be the leader to lead others out of that situation. So you can't let it defeat you because the lives of others could be dependent on you and how you respond to the situation. And God is just like that. He always sets up the most remarkable circumstances to rescue his people in the most unpredictable and unexpected ways. When you look at the record, God has used the most unpredictable and silliest things to accomplish the greatest thing in the history of mankind. And why is that? It's just how he operates. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 and 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And this is when he does his best work because that way, if he takes something that's foolish and he takes something that's weak and he takes something that people have held down and dis and dismissed over the years and over time, yes. that way you know it's not you. Yes. Yes. And they know it's not man, but it's God. It's God. And that's why he uses the people that he uses and the things that he uses. And that's why Gideon was the perfect example. And in this case, the Israelites landed in a bad situation because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But how many people know, yes, you, we're not perfect. None of us here are perfect. No prophet, no man, no woman, no child, no preacher, no teacher, no pastor. No one's perfect. And we make bad choices sometimes that end us up in bad, that cause us to be in bad situations. 
doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer the consequences of our situations, but God may not allow us to stay there. He needs us to move forward. Okay, so every action has a consequence, both negative or positive, depending on what the action was. And so for seven years, because of their disobedience, they stayed in this oppressed state. And that's a long time to be oppressed. But God didn't leave them because he still chose a deliverer. He still heard the cries of his people. He kept an open ear to them, to their prayers, to their worship, to their cries, to their fasting. He heard them and he saw them. And even though they had been disobedient and did not keep them exclusive, leave, did not keep their worship exclusive to God, he still was able to hear them and see them and know that they were there. So during their waiting time, as they're rebuilding and they're drawing themselves closer to God, it's not wasted time. It's time for you to reflect, even in your oppressed situation, because you're not going to stay there forever. So when you come out, are you going to go back to the same cycle of doing the same things that got you where you were? Or are you going to have new behaviors? Yes, yes. And so while they, they turned from him, he still, he allowed them to pray. And he sent word to his people that once again he would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies and their oppressors. And that gives us hope, people of God, to know that regardless of our situation, because we're still living here on earth, because you're still sitting in those pews and you're not sitting in the funeral home, because you're not buried dead and gone, because there's still breath yeah. in your lungs, yeah. because you still have your right mind, even when it doesn't feel like you have your right mind, you had a right enough mind to be here to worship God, and because you're still on here, on this side of heaven, God has not closed off heaven from us, meaning we can still pray, we can still worship, we can still give him thanksgiving for who he is while we can. Yes. And let's take a look at who it is that God sends. In Judges 6 and 11, the angel of the Lord goes to the man of God to tell him that he's going to be the one to deliver his people. Gideon was threshing wheat when the angel of the Lord, which represents the presence of God, came and sat down under the tree to address him. Can you imagine? This tells us two things about how our relationship with God should be or what it should look like. Number one, when we're focused on the good work that we are to do, it's easy for our angels, our calling, and our miracles to find us. They don't have to search to and fro from the earth because we're where we're supposed to be doing what we're supposed to be doing and not in mess. But we're keeping our hand to the plow. So number one, in our relationship with God, we have to be in place and be productive. So if you off gallivanting somewhere else, your angel, your miracle, your calling may not be able to find you. You need to be in church. You need to be worshiping. You need to be out serving the community. You need to be out in your prayer closet praying to God. Wherever it is that he has called you to be, to be productive. If your angel was looking for you right now, where would you be? What would you be doing? And when you leave here, what would you, where would you be? What would you be doing? And kind of ask yourself that sometimes when you go into different places. What if my angel came to me right now? Would I be embarrassed? Would I be hurt? Would I be in the right state for my blessing? So it's about positioning and staying focused and being productive. And the second thing it tells us about how our relationship with God should be is that the angel of the presence of the Lord, it says that it sat down. Sat down with Gideon. That symbolizes that there was a relationship and comfort level between God and Gideon. I don't go someplace and sit down if I'm not comfortable or if I don't plan on staying there for a long time. I don't know about you. But we need to check our communication with God to make sure he knows that his spirit can find enough comfort in our presence. That he can pull up a chair and set a spell and tell us all about it. That we can have that conversation with God whenever he is ready to grace us with our presence. Or whenever we need him, we can go to him. But there's comfort in being able to sit in the presence of God to be able to rest in 
in the presence of God. God would not have come and sat if he didn't feel a comfort, if there wasn't a previous relationship. Amen. I don't go up to strange people and just sit down and start talking. You have to know somebody. Amen. You have to know somebody. So this angel comes and he sits and he starts to let Gideon know. Gideon, you, you, you the one. And Gideon did not believe that there would be one because of how long they had been in their situation, how long their circumstance had been going on. And, and, and they remember hearing the stories of old with Moses and splitting the Red Sea and burning bushes and, and Pharaoh and let my people go. They remember all these stories of their ancestors. They know it, but they haven't seen it in so long. And that same group has now spiraled into this mess. So you forget. You forget what God did. So, and even if God were to do it again, why would he select me? He's the weakest. He considers himself the weakest in all of the land and the least in his family. I'm not as, as smart as, as, as my, my little brother or I'm not as athletic as, as, as my big brother and, and, and people don't like me I'm not as popular as, as my sister and then I have cousins and everybody knows them and then you know, and I was the least of everybody I got I got the least and I got the last and, and, and why would you pick me God when there, there was so and so over there he's so much smarter and stronger and, and, and prettier and more articulate and doesn't stutter and, and, and dots all their I's and crosses all their T's and they, they always dress really, really nice and, and they always know what to say and they, they always know what to do. So why little old me? The same reason why he chose Moses to stutter. Why me? I'm not worthy. I, I, I got a pass. I used to do this back in the day and everybody knows what I used to do. Then that makes you the perfect candidate. Because when they see it, they'll know it's not you. That's just how God operates. God likes to use what others have cast away and considered unworthy. That is who he elects to do his best work. Some of us struggle from time to time with our identity in Christ or feel that we may be the least of everyone, but don't you know that you're the very one that God is going to use to do remarkable things in the earth because you have a unique testimony and you are the best fit for this unordinary battle because this is not... An ordinary battle. And when you have something unordinary, you need the unordinary to accomplish it. And it's not going to make sense to the common man. So as we go, God responds to Gideon by saying that he will be with him and strike down all of his enemies. Now, if I'm on my way to fight an army, it, it would seem like to me I need some things, right? Is that just me? How many veterans do we have here? And how many have seen war? Bless the Lord for saving and keeping you and bringing you back. And so with that, I'm thinking if I'm going to war, and this is for me just a civilian who's never been to war, but just what I would think, I, I would think I would need some men, folk, women, folks, some willing vessels to come along with me. And so Gideon rounds up, he has 32,000 men. Okay? Which, in comparison, sounds like a lot. 32,000 men, that's a lot of men. But for what they're going to go and fight, it's not. Because the Midianites had more. And so I, I would think 32,000, even though he may need more, that's still a pretty decent number to work with. I would think if I was one of more, maybe more. Um, I could take more because I don't think you could have enough men to fight in the battle and, and, and especially when you're outnumbered by men and resources from your enemy. So my common sense would say 32,000, we'll work with it if that's the best we can get. But I want all 32 of my 32,000. Okay? I want all 32,000 of my 32,000. And because God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways, God said you had too many. I would say no. But God said, got too many. 
32,000 of them. It's just way too many, Gideon. And, and when we look at chapter 7 and look at verse 1, God begins to weed out people who will not be effective for Gideon's mission. Instead of taking a large army, God says to Gideon that he has too many men and he cannot deliver Midian into their hands. Too many. Too many men. I'm going to fight a war. How can I possibly have too many men? But this is not an ordinary battle. So no ordinary men can go. God gave two ways to weed out those who are not meant for this battle. And you have to remember that whenever God takes you through situations in your life and different battles, everybody can't go. The person that was with you back in the day, they may not be able to be fit for this. They might not can take it. They might distract you. They might create different situations. And God says, I can't deliver media into their hands. That's not who I want for this battle. I need to weed out some people. So some of those old relationships that you used to have and they're breaking away, that meant God had to separate you from those things that would take away from where it is that you're going. So don't don't, don't be dismayed because the people that you used to hang out with or that you used to know, you, you, you can't be with them anymore because there's a different purpose and there's a different path and there's a yeah, different plan. Yeah, yeah. And God will remove people. He will yeah. weed them out in his own process for where you're going because you don't know that could have been the very person that could destroy it all or cost you the battle even though they're your friend. So God uses two methods in order to weed out the 32,000. The first one is those who had fear in their hearts from being down for so long. Or maybe they just lost courage. He said, don't worry about it. Y'all go back to the house. They were full of fear with an enemy who for seven years had beaten them down. So you are afraid of war. Or you were afraid of this enemy because he destroyed you to that point in all those years. And you didn't know how to stand up against that bully. You didn't know how to stand up against that oppression. You didn't know how to stand up against that person that took something from you in your past. You can't face it just yet. If you still have that fear in your heart, you can't participate in this battle. Because that's the enemy you're going to face. This, one, this battle is not for the weak heart. And if we are around people who have succumbed to a weakened heart because of their circumstances, they're going to affect the overall effectiveness and cohesiveness of the group. Their fear and murmuring could have knocked everyone else off course and prevented victory from happening. Because fear is like cancer that sinks in and creates negativity that spreads all throughout the vital organs and prevents the entire body from functioning properly until the whole thing is dead. That's why we cut out cancer. It takes over. It takes hold, it takes control, and it's paralyzing. So when you have negativity, and you have negative people in your lives, you, you, you might need to block that call, or, 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 or unfriend them. It's not personal, it's just, this is not an ordinary battle, so I can't have that negativity in this fight. I can't have that negativity in this season for what God is about to do in my life and about to do for me. I can't take your negativity. I can't take your naysay. Well, I'm just trying to give you the other side. Thank you for the other side, but I got this side. I appreciate it, but 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 I, I, I can't focus on that right now. Because you're going to talk me out of the battle that's designed to deliver me. So, thank you. Appreciate it. But I'm good. I'm good. The second way that God separates them it, it, it is, is very different, but that's just God. In the way he does this, he separates the men from the boys, and he says in verse 4, he tells Gideon to take them to the water, and the way they drink the water is going to tell you if they can endure this upcoming battle. The way I drink water... Perhaps there were some in the first group, because we said, if you're fearful, you go home. But then there's sometimes you're like, no, I can't be scared, I can't be scared, I can't be scared. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 I'm going to stay here. 
and I'm gonna fight this good fight. I'm scared to death. I'm scared to the dickens. But hey, I'm not gonna let them see me scared. Even though thousands of us left, I'm not gonna be in that crowd. I ain't scared. I ain't scared. Okay. But then this was really gonna separate you. So this additional test to see if they could cut the mustard was 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 quite different. It was unique. And God allowed the men to drink from water, from, from, from a body of water. And the very way they drank the water let God know if they were suitable for this battle. And it's weird because I think it's the places that God wants to send us. It requires attentiveness to the little things that we sometimes take for granted or the little things that we sometimes don't recognize. I would never think that the way I drink a glass of water would determine if I would get a job or the way, the way I might hold open a door for somebody or smile at somebody or show courtesy to somebody will make all the difference in the world. But God notices those little things and so do other people and it says a lot about our character. Glory. It says a lot about our character. And it symbolized, the way they drank the water symbolized something to God. And, and I have to question, why would God select those who lap like dogs versus those who plunged head first into the water? So they went to the water. And the way God divided them was based off of how they drank the water. And those who, who, who dove head first into the water were excluded from the ones who kneeled, cut the water, and lapped like dogs. Why would God select them versus the ones who would dive in head first? What does that mean? What does that symbolize? Would they be the most willing and obedient and best suited for the battle? Because Again, this is no ordinary battle. Or maybe their technique reflected their ability to restrain themselves even when they were thirsty. Men that had endurance and self-control even though they were all thirsty. Men who knew how to get their nourishment without overindulging too much so that they could be useful for battle, not completely full, and who would slow them down. People who crazy enough to drown themselves because every friend designed for every battle in the world. Sometimes you might hear that friend is going to get down dirty and get his head in the dirt. But sometimes you just need your dog by your side. You need to get your friend by your side. The one that's your homie that's going to be able to play with you. That's for you. Encourage you. Sometimes you just need a different kind of friend. Hallelujah! So God reduced the 32,000 all the way down to 300. Not 3,200. Not 3,000. 300. So I got to go to a battle with 300 people to fight people that are way more plentiful than me with more resources because I've been in poverty all this time. 300 people. But with God, it's not always about quantity. It's about quality. Come on, come on. God will take 300 strong come on. and do a miracle versus having 32,000. Yes, yes. Then you can't do anything with or that are unwilling. You have to have that kind of mindset when you're, you're, you're thinking about God. It's not going to be like what you would normally think. He took 32,000 and reduced them to 300. Uh -huh. and, and, and because God is about quality and, and not quantity, it, it meant that he had to divide them. He had to separate those people who would mumble and complain and ruin the mission and people who would be negative and, 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 and take away from the things that God had ordained to happen in this particular mission. And he had to find people that would gird up their loins, have faith, and endure to the very end. God specializes in the small things of our lives. Small things can have a great impact. So you might think yourself small, but know that you're mighty in the sight of God. And God can multiply your smallness to have a greater impact than a thousand. Because he's God. And he's about quality and not quantity. Quality worship. Quality service. Yes. Yes. Quality friendship. Quality interaction with people. Quality. In agape, I feel like we have quality. 
Yes. We're not an extremely large church, but we've never been without. Come on. Come on. God has supplied every need. Yes. He's filled every void. We've not gone lacking for any good thing because he has multiplied. Uh -huh. Because we have quality. We have quality. And so when we look at the text in verse 12, we see just how many Gideon and his small army of 300 were up against. And it, it, it's not looking too good. It reads, it says in verse 12, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. That meant that there were so many you couldn't even see between them. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. They had more camels than I do people. The Midianites were not just the Midianites anymore. They went and got friends. So now I'm going to have to fight my enemy and the enemy of my enemy and my enemy's enemy and his enemy too. I can't win this. And if I'm turning around and I'm looking at my 300 people, I'm thinking, y'all, I'm sorry. Maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe I should have sat a little longer under the tree. Maybe that's not exactly what God said. Maybe that's not what he told me. I, I, I just don't look right at all. Let me go back and get the, the other thousands of people we left behind. I don't care how they drink. I don't care what they do. What kind of they care. Because we can't win this. It's looking bad, y'all. It's looking bad. But that's God. When it closes in and you're at the end of your rope, you're at the end of your faith, and you see your enemy before you and it's greater and more powerful than you and all you got is your little bit. The light bill's $89 and you got nine. Like that kind of struggle. That's a suicide mission. I don't have enough. I'm lacking. I'm setting this up for failure, and I'm their leader. There's no way I can win this. And we're going to war, and I don't have a missile. I don't have a tank. I don't have a machine gun. I don't have any artillery. I don't even have night vision goggles. I don't have armor. I don't have anything. No weapons. <clears throat> Nothing to really, really fight for war. And then, when I look at my men that I have, these ain't West Point graduates. They didn't go to start in major school. They're not, they're not Rangers. They're not Special Forces. They're not Navy SEAL. They're just 300 men who left like the Oaks. We gonna die. <laughs> and the only weapon that God gave me was a horn, an empty jar, and a torch. Am I going to go cook something? Sing? I don't know what I'm going to go do with these lapping dogs <laughs> that haven't even been through basic training. We're about to die. We're not prepared. We don't have the weapons for this fight. The only requirements was that they not be scared and how they drank some water. What is this? God sending me to battle a multitude that I cannot even count who have resources beyond what I can imagine and all I have is this. 300 lapping dogs, horns, some jars, and torches. We can light a fire and sing kumbaya, y'all. But we can't fight with that. There's no way I'm equipped for this battle. This is nonsense, God. You, you don't go to war with these things. I, I can at least fight with my fist. You can at least give me that. At least give me a stick. Give me something, Lord. Can you hear me? Mm. Mm. But this is no ordinary battle. So you can't use ordinary things. Yeah. You can't use the things you're used to. Your old methods won't work this time. Mm -hmm. The things you understand, they will fail. Mm. You can't use what you're used to. Of what makes sense to you. Because this is not about you. This is the battle of the Lord. God is going to take foolish things in our lives. And do great things so that we know it is him and not us. 
You may not have specialized weapons or resources that others have, but you've got something more powerful than man could ever imagine. You got intel. Intel is short for intelligence, but not just your mental intellect. That's not the kind of intel I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual intel. You see, there's nothing better than good intel. And intel that comes from God is spiritual intel. And the intel was God had already told them, baby, you won the battle. You're going to win. Even though it looks like you're going to perish a million times over because you're not set up for success. But it looks that way because this is no ordinary battle. And you would not depend on me if I gave you enough. According to your logic and your thought process, you would think that you did it. And this is not your fight. It is the fight of the Lord. So God eased Gideon's concerns by telling him to go down and listen to a conversation between his enemies so that Gideon can be reassured he was doing the right thing. You have, have you ever been in the right place at the right time to hear the right thing? I have. And it's been a blessing. Gideon heard this conversation and it gave him reassurance and encouragement to move forward with the original plan despite what the circumstances looked like. At every step of his journey, God sent Gideon confirmation and a peace that everything was going to be all right. Even though you're in your circumstance right now, God will give you peace and he will confirm to you every step of the way when you trust him that it's going to be okay. You're going to win even if it looks like foolishness. You're going to be a conqueror in this situation. Everything really is well. From the fleece in chapter 6 for confirmation to him hearing the enemies in this chapter, God gave him confirmation. He was on the right path. He was in the right place. God will give us confirmation. He will give us encouragement. He will give us peace when we are truly in his will, even in circumstances and our human intellect tells, we, tells us we should be concerned or afraid because we have common sense and we're human beings and sometimes things don't always look right but when you have the peace of God, you have the communication with God to know God, he'll give you peace and his peace will sit down beside you and resonate with you. He'll give you direction but there's some things that you have to do just like Gideon did. Number one, you have to have diligence. We have to be diligent in the things of God and doing what is right to sustain our being. When God visited Gideon, Gideon was in the middle of working. Sometimes we get weary in our work but God cannot call us to a greater work until we are faithful of the few things for which we are assigned. Keep doing what you're doing in your good work and God will exalt he will lift you up. He will take you before great men and do to promote you. To exalt you. To lift you up. To make you ruler over many things because you were faithful over the fear. The second thing like Gideon, relationship. God and Gideon had a relationship which is how they were able to have a conversation. Prayer is conversation with God. If you do not know how to have a conversation with God, how do you know when it's his voice? You know his voice by having these regular talks called prayer. Think about the voice of your honey pie, your loved one, the one that you treasure, the one that makes your liver quiver. Think about that for a second. Or maybe you don't have one of those. Maybe you got a mom. Or maybe you got a daddy. Or maybe you got an auntie. Or maybe you have a cousin. But you got somebody in your life that, that's of relevance to you. And when they call, even if they call and they got a 1-800 number and it looks like a bill collector, and you pick it up and you know that voice, right? You know what they sound like. You know how they breathe. You know their speech patterns. You know that it's them. You know how they feel based off of how they talk. God wants that same kind of relationship and communication with us so that we know his voice. And then thirdly, worship. Gideon was not afraid to worship God in advance for the victory. In verse 15, it says, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. Worship is deeper than conversation. See, the conversation starts. The conversation starts. It's the beginning part. It's like when you bring in flowers or writing a love letter or, or, or saying, hey, how you doing? It's that beginning part of the conversation. And then it goes deeper. It goes deeper because worship is total and absolute submission and reverence to God just because he's holy 
and he is God. Sometimes we don't get victory because we don't have the faith or know how to completely surrender to God without motive or fashion and simply worship. It's more than just saying thank you God, hallelujah. It's more than just that. It's deeper. We don't know how to bow, some of us, before him and call him the Lord of all things and lift him up. Worship is not asking God for anything. Worship is entering into the body of holiness and then giving it a heart to lift up God for no other reason than just because he's God. Worship is not about us. Because we lose us when we worship him. Worship is for us. Amen. Because we lose ourselves in him. Glory. It's when we offer him the depths of our worship. We win the unordinary battles. The
Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. So God allowed for a transition. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. And they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, while each man held his position around the camp. All the Midianites ran, crying as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Their enemies fled, y'all. They cried, and God turned their enemies against themselves, and they destroyed themselves. So they see them coming to kill you. They see them coming to deny you of your victory. Not ours. 